was the enrichment of the colonists and the Spanish crown. The effort being Spanish, it was felt that the reward should be hers. So the Spanish colonial trade was monopolized by Spaniards. This was the mercantilist perception of the colonial idea, strongest always with Spain. Until 1717, the headquarters for colonial administration was here in Seville. This great square building was built in 1598 as the Stock Exchange, and later as the Archivo General de Indias. It came to house the paper produced by the colonial bureaucracy. Here the paper remains, neat row after row, room after room. By 1700, some 400,000 regulations governing colonial affairs had been issued. An effort in 1681 to consolidate and codify these had produced some 11,000 chapters. Those that applied, the colonial administrators were presumed to know and follow. The Spanish Empire may have survived only because its regulations were so numerous that no one imagined that they could be enforced. Thanks very much. Some of the surviving paper is an absolute delight. Here is a letter from Columbus himself, dated the 5th of February, 1505. It's to his son, Diego, and it deals with various family, financial, and business affairs. This letter is from Cortez in 1526. He describes his voyage from Havana by way of San Juan to Mexico, and he warns that there are some very rebellious tendencies in the New World. This one is dated 1539, and it's from Francisco Pizarro to the Queen of Spain. Pizarro says he is sending her some emeralds, and he very thoughtfully asks, that she acknowledged by receipt. Some authorities we saw earlier believe that Urban II launched the Crusades because he was attracted by the idea of having the Crusaders, whom many people thought a rather inconvenient set of ruffians, safely away from Europe and in the Holy Land. I think it's fair to say that any Spaniard who knew the Pizarro brothers well must have rejoiced at their being in Peru. These documents, this great pile of papers, tell their own tale about the eternal ways of bureaucracy. In 1654, as they tell, uh, one of the great cathedral churches of Mexico was badly in need of repairs and restoration. And permission was being sought to spend money to fix it up. Permission was still being sought 20 years later in 1672, and the matter was not disposed of for another 60 years. Eventually, like all the others, the Spanish Empire came to an end. Partly it was a revolt of the powerful colonists against the Spanish bureaucracy, which sought, among other things, to restrict their greed. Partly it was because the Spaniards, in common with all others, had ceased to believe that the colonies were worth the effort. Spain had come to rely on colonial troops for colonial defense, proof again of the diminishing interest. The Bonapartes, after 1808, did not command colonial loyalty. Why fight for a Corsican sovereign? Spanish decolonization, as was often the case, was in two stages. First came independence, power to those who had power in the colonies. Then, as in Mexico, Cuba, Peru, came the further revolt against those who had succeeded to power after the break with Spain, the great landlords, and also the foreigners in the church. This further revolution is one that still goes on. Spanish colonialism makes yet another point. The revolt, when it comes, will be against both the governing country and its colonial policy. 
the Spanish colonies were elaborately, meticulously governed, over-governed. This no one has thought to be true of independent Latin America. British colonialism, on the other hand, was informal, decentralized, relaxed, and the same was true of the colonial administration of the Dutch and in less than a measure that of the French. Until the last century, except for the special case of India, Britain didn't even have a central department for colonial affairs. This tradition, the British tradition, was far more open to the Smithian ideas which made both colonies and the colonists responsible for their own well-being. Colonial management in India was delegated, of course, to the East India Company, and this was its staff college at Haleybury near London. The company employed three of the great economists of the last century, Malthus, James Mill, and John Stuart Mill. But they joined with David Ricardo in opposing exclusive trading privileges for the company. The hand of government should be light, trade should be free. And so, relatively speaking, it was. In the Spanish colonies in 1776, the government of George III would have been thought a beacon of liberalism. In the time of Clive and Warren Hastings, the British motive in India was fairly candid. It was to trade, make money, to govern, kept order, showed the flag to such end. But with time, motives became more complex. It was a civilizing mission, a need to help a backward people. And above all, there was a concern for government and the rule of law. And these, we must be clear, came to have a specific place and power of their own. In 1856, two years before the East India Company gave way to direct British rule, a young Englishman came here to Haleybury to prepare for a career in India. His name was John Beams. Haleybury was a happy place, though rather a farce as far as learning was concerned. In fact, you might learn as much or as little as you liked. But while the facilities for not learning were considerable, those for learning were in practice somewhat scanty. The men, few in number, who really ground or mugged or sweated, euphemisms by which the use of the word work was avoided, were looked on by the majority as amiable but misguided enthusiasts and as fit objects for the more boisterous kinds of practical joking. A good many of the men were sons of members of the Indian civil and military services. In spite of this, however, there was little or nothing in the tone of the place or in our habits indicative of our connection with that country. It's obvious that Haley Berry did not turn out carefully disciplined bureaucrats in the Spanish mold, well-versed in Indian affairs. The graduates were meant to cope with whatever problems might arise by drawing on a liberal education and common sense. However, one should also allow for the possibility that Haley Berry had poor teachers and was badly run. No one should ever assume deep recondite purposes when there is such a good and everyday explanation as that. It was considered bad form to talk about India or to allude to the fact that we were all going there soon. All we knew was that it was beastly hot and that there were niggers there and that it would be time enough to bother about it when you got there. Beams got there in 1859. He was 22, and his first posting was to the Punjab, which had been subdued in the next only 10 years before. His district, a large one, was Gujarat, north and west of Lahore. He journeyed there by Dakgari and mail cart from Calcutta. Especially as regards his early life in India, Beam says something very close to total recall. I doubt that there is a better guide to the motivating forces in British colonialism in the last century, or a better warning against oversimplification. The mail cart for Gujarat turned out to be a small box on two wheels. The seats were set with an iron rod, so contrived that at every jolt it caught the passenger sharply in the back, inflicting acute pain. The coachman drove like Jehu, the son of Nimshi. He seldom slackened speed and very nearly 